Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain a horror film called Tusk. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. Wallace has been scouring the internet for humiliating videos to show it to his friend, Teddy, on their popular podcast, The Not Sea Party. One day, a fan sends him a video of a kid accidentally chopping his leg off with a katana. The video has since gone viral, and the boy has been dubbed as the Kill Bill Kid. As they watch the video during their show, Teddy says he's starting to feel bad for the boy. Wallace, however, feels no sympathy, pointing out that he has become famous with 30 million hits on the internet. Later on, they announce that Wallace will travel to Manitoba, Canada, to interview the Kill Bill Kid for their next episode. Before signing off, Wallace takes cheap potshots at the kid, saying he hopes that the boy doesn't cry too much during the interview. When he arrives at the boy's house, he's puzzled when he sees a funeral flower at the doorstep. He then hears someone crying, so he walks to the yard and discovers that they're holding a funeral for the Kill Bill Kid. He soon learns that the boy had killed himself with his own sword. While having a drink at Bar H, Wallace calls Teddy, expressing his frustration that the boy didn't wait for two more days for the interview. Wallace tells Teddy that he couldn't come back home without any material for their show, so he decides to find someone else to interview. In the bathroom, he finds a handbill from a man offering free lodging in his woodland home to anyone interested in performing household chores for him. The man, Howard, says that he can no longer do the simple tasks because he's confined to the wheelchair. Wallace's interest is roused by Howard's promise to share stories about his adventures in the ocean when he was younger, so he takes the invitation. During a stop at a convenience store, Wallace calls Howard looking for his address. Howard instructs him to go to Biverest, so Wallace asks the clerks how far it is from the store. The two girls tell him that he's still quite far, noting that it's about two hours away. Upon his arrival, Wallace and Howard immediately get acquainted. After offering Wallace some tea, Howard asks Wallace about his purpose since he's not interested in staying at the house. Wallace explains that he came to hear about his adventures so he could talk about them on his podcast. The two start drinking, and Howard starts narrating his memorable adventures, starting with meeting Ernest Hemingway in Normandy on D-Day. Hemingway had been prohibited from joining the raid, so he stayed on the boat. Hemingway was disappointed that he doesn't get to engage in combat, so he goes to the galley to find alcohol. Howard, who worked as a potato peeler at the time, offers him a bottle of Weiser. After hearing about the casualties from the battle, Hemingway utters his famous quote, only do sober what you do drunk. It will teach you to keep your mouth shut. Howard shows him the bottle he offered to Hemingway, saying it's just an old bottle, but it becomes a powerful talisman when combined with the story. Soon, a phallic-shaped artifact on the wall catches Wallace's eye. Howard says that it is a baculum from a walrus. He explains that it's a bone found in the reproductive organ of placental mammals to aid them during intercourse. Howard contends that it's only proper to admire the walrus because it's one of the noblest creatures on the planet. When Wallace asks how Howard came across the artifact, Howard reveals that he once had a profound encounter with a walrus when he was lost at sea. He tells Wallace that the shipwreck happened on the southern coast of Siberia in 1959 when they were searching for the great white shark. They never found the shark because their ship collided with an iceberg. After the boat sank, Howard swam alone in the dark, terrified. Soon, he wakes up on a small island and learns that a walrus had saved him. Howard recalls that even with its large tusks, the animal is gentle as a cow. Howard says he named it Mr. Tusk, after the only authority figure he trusted, a janitor named Mr. Tuskegee. He says he's never had such a fulfilling friendship with anyone. As Howard continues to describe his experience with the walrus, Wallace starts feeling drowsy and falls to the floor. Howard tells Wallace he will be alright and calls him Mr. Tusk. Before Wallace went to Canada, his girlfriend, Allie, tried to stop him because she doesn't want to make fun of the Kill Bill kid in his own home. Wallace points out that the teenager reached out to him after turning down Oprah Winfrey. He claims that he doesn't intend to make fun of the boy, and he's only doing it for his show. Allie notes that the Wallace she fell in love with would never exploit a kid. Wallace, however, stresses that his old self couldn't pay his bills because he was unsuccessful as a comedian. He says he prefers his new persona because he could make a lot of money from the ads from his podcast and his merchandise. Allie urges him to take her to Canada with him, but Wallace argues that Teddy would get weird and jealous. Furthermore, Wallace worries that he wouldn't be as funny if she's with him because he would be distracted. As Wallace prepares to make love, Allie tells him that she misses the old Wallace because he was so sweet and soft. Allie teases Wallace, saying he used to cry over Winnie the Pooh. Back at Howard's home, Wallace wakes up in a wheelchair. Howard, who's polishing a tusk across the room, says he got scared when he saw Wallace collapse the previous night. He tells Wallace that he passed out because he was bit by a spider called the Brown Recluse. Still dazed, Wallace asks him for his phone, but Howard tells him that a certain Dr. Mosher broke it while treating Wallace. When Wallace notices that he can't feel his legs, Howard informs him that it's the spinal injection because the spider had filled him with so much poison that his ankle became swollen. Howard then mentions that Dr. Mosher had to amputate his leg to prevent the venom from traveling to his heart. When he removes the blanket on his thigh, he's shocked to see that his legs have been cut off at the knee. Wallace demands to know why he wasn't brought to a hospital, so Howard tells him the doctor felt it's best to recuperate at the house because hospitals are full of diseases. Wallace can't make sense of the situation, so he asks to talk to the doctor. Howard, however, claims that the doctor is making his rounds. 
Howard begins to narrate his experiences again, but Wallace gets frustrated and tells him that he's no longer interested in his stories. Wallace tries to get up but sees he's been tied up. Howard laughs at him as he explains that he put the belt to keep him from falling from the chair. When Wallace asks to borrow a phone, Howard says that the doctor removed all the communication devices from the house so Wallace wouldn't be disturbed while he recovers. Before leaving the room, Howard holds back his laughter as he tells Wallace that he's sorry about his predicament. That night, Howard serves dinner, but Wallace couldn't eat because he can't move his arms. Howard informs him that he's still incapacitated because he's been injected with morphine for his leg pain. When Wallace starts to suspect that there was no spider, Howard mocks him by singing Itsy Bitsy Spider. Wallace yells at him, asking him to let him out but is shocked to see Howard getting up from his wheelchair. Howard walks toward him and slaps him in the face as he calls for help. When Howard gets back to his chair, he reveals that he's been creating a walrus suit. Wallace starts to feel disheartened as he listens to Howard explaining his bizarre fixation with walruses. Howard says that when Wallace wears the suit, he must act like a walrus and stop using his human voice. Wallace starts begging Howard to let him go. When Wallace asks him about his motive, Howard tells him that he intends to find out if a man is really a walrus at heart. When Wallace yells for help again, Howard mocks him by screaming along with him. Meanwhile, Ali pours her heart out to another man because she has started to resent Wallace for cheating on her. She stresses that she also hates herself for putting her life on hold for him. Ali cherishes the moments he spends with the man because he restores her every time Wallace destroys her. During the podcast episode before Wallace's trip to Canada, Teddy disclosed that he would be taking Ali to the Getty because Wallace is disinterested in art. When they sign off, Teddy mentions that Ali wants to go with him to Canada. But Wallace stresses that he doesn't want Ali around when he interviews the Kill Bill kid because he can't be himself if she's there. Wallace is irritated with Ali at times because she constantly berates him for doing mean comedy. Wallace then confesses that he wants to be with other women even though he finds Ali hot. He tells Teddy that he's going over to Ali's place to have intercourse with her before his trip. Back in Howard's house, Wallace hears his phone ringing, so he tries to follow the sound. As he reaches the phone, the ringing stops. He sees it's a missed call from Ali. Wallace calls her back, but she wouldn't answer, so he leaves a message. He whispers into the phone, asking Ali for help, saying a man had abducted him and wants to turn him into an animal. Wallace tells her that he's really scared that he'll never see her again and apologizes for the way he treated her. Meanwhile, Teddy brushes his teeth and gets ready to spend the night with Ali. Wallace leaves Teddy a voice message to ask him for help as well. As Wallace gives Teddy details about his situation, Howard approaches him from behind and hits him in the head. Howard tells Wallace that his life as a human is over, and he'll have to become a walrus if he wants to survive. In the morning, Allie hears the voice message on her phone while she brushes her teeth. After learning that Wallace is in trouble, she wakes Ted up and lets him hear the message. When Allie looks at Teddy's phone, she learns that Wallace left a message for him as well. She returns Wallace's call, but he couldn't answer because Howard is performing an operation on him. Howard tells him that it's good to know that someone cares for him, recalling that the only one that ever showed him any affection was Mr. Tusk. He tells Wallace that he had been exploited when he was a young boy. He narrates that he was placed at an orphanage after his mother and father were killed by muggers in Montreal. Not long after, the children at the orphanages were sent to an insane asylum because a corrupt politician shut down the orphanages and reclassified them as mental health institutions to get funding from the government. During his five years at the asylum, he was beaten and tortured. He says that people at the asylum, including priests, politicians, and nuns, have forced themselves on him. When he was 15, he managed to escape from Canada and made his way to the US. When Howard finishes the operation on Wallace, his arms have been sewed to his torso, and his other leg has also been cut off. Meanwhile, Ali and Teddy alert the authorities about Wallace's abduction as they drive to Manitoba. In an underground room, Howard finishes fitting the walrus costume onto Wallace's body. Howard begins reciting poetry as Wallace screeches at him. Howard, speaking to Wallace as if he's Mr. Tusk, says he misses the time they spent together when he was shipwrecked at Ponder Rock. Howard recites another poem expressing his regret of leaving Mr. Tusk behind to be with humans again. He feels like he made a mistake going back, citing the atrocities humans commit against each other. Ali and Teddy track down Wallace by showing his picture at car rental companies. When they get to the police station, they let a detective hear Wallace's last message to them. The detective asks them if they're sure Wallace isn't pulling a prank, pointing out that they usually clown around in their podcasts. Teddy assures the cop that Wallace wouldn't go too far with his jokes. The detective is baffled by the part of Wallace's message where he says Howard had cut off his leg. He then recalls that a former detective from Quebec had recently asked him if they found legless bodies around their jurisdiction. The detective gives them the number of the former cop, Guy Lapointe, who had been hunting for a serial killer in Canada. Back at the house, Howard forces Wallace to learn to swim as a walrus by forcibly pulling him into the water with a remote control chain. Wallace manages to stay up in the water, but he couldn't stay afloat for long. At the bottom of the pool, Wallace is struck with terror when he discovers a human corpse in a walrus costume. In Manitoba, Ali and Teddy meet up with Guy, who has been hunting for Howard Howe for the last decade. He discloses that he sacrificed several marriages and even his sanity just to find Howard. He hasn't been sleeping well because of his obsession, but when Ali and Teddy contacted him, he finally slept like a baby because he now knows that he's close to catching Howard. 
Guy reveals that Howard has already killed 23 people, and the number could go up to 24 if they don't find Wallace soon. Guy says that Howard's MO has remained the same over the years. The authorities usually find the pieces of the skin body a month after the victim's disappearance. The legs are always removed at the knees, and arms are sewed to the body. The victim's mouth and teeth are always mutilated, with their tongues ripped out. Guy explains that he strongly believes that he had met Howard a few years back while he was looking for a missing hockey player in Quebec. During the search, he came across a secluded cabin. When Guy approached the house, a man named Bartholomew Mosier asks him to kill a spider in his bathroom. Bartholomew, who speaks with a goofy voice, tells Guy that he called the police to deal with the spider. Guy, however, says the police did not send him, but he's looking for a hockey player named Gregory Gumtree. Before his disappearance, Gregory had seen an advertisement offering him a place to stay. Guy asks the man if he's seen anything suspicious on Monday night, but he tells him that he was at the rink running errands for a hockey team called the Little Mites. The man tells Guy that they usually go to a restaurant on Mondays. Before Guy leaves, Bartholomew asks him again if he's sure he's not there to kill the spider. Guy says he's not paid enough to deal with savage animals. Bartholomew responds by saying he thinks that the real savages are humans. Guy tells them that he has since discovered that there's no record of a man named Bartholomew Mosier, and there's no team called the Little Mites. He surmises that Gregory was probably at the house when he paid a visit. A month later, the authorities find Gregory's body clogging up a sewer pipe outside Gatineau. By that time, Bartholomew had already disappeared. Guy had been fired from the force because he challenged the theory that meat hooks caused the mutilation in the victim's mouths. He points out that Gumtree also had holes in the roof of his mouth, and the authorities found a tiny piece of his own tibia bone inside one hole. When Guy asks Gumtree's mother what she thinks happened to her son, the mother says that the killer is making a monster. Back at the house, Howard asks Wallace why he's still mourning the loss of his humanity. He explains that during his travels, he only found that humans are cruel. He tells Wallace that he's already tired from being battered by life and by fate. Howard senses that Wallace must be hungry, so he throws him a mackerel and tells him to eat up. Howard leaves the pool area to watch Wallace eat the fish through the window. When Wallace finally takes a bite, Howard is satisfied that Wallace seems to be adapting to his life as a walrus, so he leaves him alone. Before leaving to search for Wallace, Guy asks Ali about his driving habits, so Ali tells him that Wallace likes buying large drinks from convenience stores. When they show Wallace's photo to a store clerk, the woman recognizes him as Mr. Mustache. Guy soon learns that Wallace had written the address of his destination on a pad. Guy asks the store clerk for the pad Wallace used and shades it with a pencil to see what was written on the previous page. Meanwhile, Howard enters the water with Wallace to help him swim. Howard reveals to Wallace that he had killed Mr. Tusk at Ponder Rock when he ran out of food. When he was rescued, he saw the animal's blood on his hand and immediately regretted what he has done. He tells Wallace that Mr. Tusk wasn't prepared for the fight the last time. He assures him that it would be different this time because he's already shown him how cruel man can be. When Guy finds Wallace's rented car in a swamp, he hands Ali and Teddy guns to prepare them for an encounter with Howard, noting that he is very dangerous. Back at the subterranean room, Howard dons a walrus suit, as he discloses that he had killed Mr. Tusk an hour before his rescue. He says that he is now giving the walrus a fighting chance to commemorate the day he killed the animal. Wallace keeps screaming as he fights against Howard. Outside, Ali hears Wallace's screams, so they rush toward the house. As they continue to fight, Howard tells Wallace that he survived longer than the others, noting that his survival instincts have kicked in. Howard then takes the walrus suit off saying his instincts have also been triggered. When Howard aims to hit Wallace with the baculum, Wallace buries his tusk on Howard's foot, causing him to drop to the ground. Wallace continues to attack by repeatedly stabbing Howard with his tusks. As Howard's life fades, he tells Wallace that he is indeed Mr. Tusk. When Teddy and Ali finally enter the room, Ali is grieved to see his appearance. Wallace bellows at them repeatedly as they look at him with pity. Guy points a shotgun at Wallace, pondering if he should put an end to his misery, but Ali stops him. A year later, Ali and Teddy go to a zoo to pay Wallace a visit. Ali calls out to Wallace, but he wouldn't come out, so Teddy suggests throwing him a mackerel. After throwing the fish to the pen, Wallace comes out to take a bite. Teddy tells Wallace that he doesn't have to hide from them. When Wallace sees Ali's tears, he recalls when she was chiding him because he no longer cries when he watches Winnie the Pooh. She narrates that when his grandmother died, she told his grandfather not to shed tears. Her grandfather, however, asserts that it's good to cry because it separates the people from animals. Before leaving the zoo, Ali tells Wallace that she loves him. Tears start to flow from Wallace's eyes as he goes back to his rock shelter. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.